That's good. The Apostle Paul made it very clear in 1 Timothy 1. He said, I was injurious and a persecutor and blasphemer, but I obtained mercy. Amen. Folks, I'll talk to you tonight about our Lord Jesus Christ as to what He said about sin. What did He say? And you'll be surprised when you put it all together. If you turn to Matthew chapter number 5, verse 28 with me, please. Matthew 5, 28. Matthew chapter number 5, verse 27. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Father, bless your word now in thy name I pray. Amen. Now for just a moment, let your mind go back 2,000 years. That's a long time, right? That's old time. Wouldn't you say old time is 2,000 years ago? Yet 2,000 years ago they said they were talking about a time that was much older than them. You have heard it said by them of old time. Referring back, of course, to Moses, 1400 B.C., who wrote the Pentateuch, and uh, whatever preceded that, that they might have known. They didn't have it written. But that's when the first written scripture showed up. So <clears throat> it's been around a long time, the principle. For example, if you take the Ten Commandments and read them over there in the book of Exodus, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. It's pretty clear. It spells it out. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Uh, honor thy father and thy mother. And all these things are in the Ten Commandments. These are commandments of God that are clear, written in stone. But when the Lord Jesus Christ began to preach, He got a whole lot deeper than what it says on the surface. It says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. The Lord Jesus says, Let me show you what it's about and goes to the very heart. He goes into a much deeper thing. So the Son of God, when He began to define the essence of sin, He says, it's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside. Amen. And you can be sinning and people think you're a saint. Yeah. And you can be sinning and people think you're living right and walking right. <coughs> to the Pharisees He said, you adulterers and adulteresses, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Now think about that. Everybody has a system that they, uh, that they draw up and make them feel good about it, you know, do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs and all that. And there's certainly, we need, we need do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs. But if you think that because of what you don't do, and if you think that because that you've got your list and you meet every point in your list that you haven't sinned, you're far from the truth. Because sin is so deceptive. It's such a deceptive thing. It's deceitful. Not only is sin deceitful, your heart is deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So when the Lord Jesus Christ starts dealing with sin, He doesn't hem haul around, beat around the bush. He comes to the issue. Do you know why? Because He's going to give Himself for your sin. In the book of Matthew chapter number 12, verses 31, 32, and Luke 12, 10, some of the most controversial thing, one of the most controversial things in the New Testament he deals with because he speaks to it in a way that people never really thought about. He said in Matthew 12, 31, Wherefore I say to you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven to men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven to men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, it's a solemn warning in Luke 12, 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Solemn warning. Mark 3, 28, Verily I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven to the sons of men, and blasphemies, whithersoever they shall blaspheme. But in verse 39, But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. That's the kind of thing a person ought to think about. 
You ought to think about that. You ought to think about how that the mouth is tied to what goes on inside a heart, person's heart when they're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Now, the Pentecostal brethren for years have used that scripture against Baptists who try to say anything about them speaking in tongues. They'll say that if you, if, you, if you say something about us speaking in tongues, you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. How many's ever heard that before? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. They'll use that on you. They'll tell you you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost if you say anything about them speaking in tongues. And of course the idea is uh, keep your mouth shut and no criticism on your part about our speaking in tongues. Uh, folks, speaking in tongues is a minuscule, very, 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 very small, small, small part of the New Testament. <laughs> very small. Very small. The New Testament is a huge book and body of faith and belief, historical and doctrinal and all of that that goes along with it. So the idea of speaking in tongues, if it consumes somebody, you've got something that's uh, out of balance. Way out of balance. Amen. Way out of balance. Make no mistake about that. But it's not about speaking in tongues tonight. It's about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. So what does that mean? Well, to blaspheme the Holy Ghost is a serious thing. It's serious. Very serious. There are those that come along today and teach, say, well, I preach you that was 2,000 years ago. You can't do that today. You can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost now. It's, uh, you know... This all passed. This is the age of grace. Well, I'd be awful careful before I threw something like that out. Yeah. I'll tell you why. Because if you'll notice, he said there's no forgiveness here or in the world to come. That puts it off into the future. That puts the retribution in the future. Not something that just happens during a short period of time, confined to a certain uh, age. What is blaspheming the Holy Ghost then? You get a kind of an idea of what's going on if you look at the book of Hebrews. Over here in Hebrews. It'll, it'll help you to begin to understand the issue. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10, verse 26. If we sin willfully, Hebrews 10, 26. If we sin willfully after the, we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. All right, let's get that settled. How many have ever sinned since you got saved? Raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> Did Satan hog tie you and drag you into it or were you complicit in it? When it originated, did it originate from inside or outside? In other words, have you ever willfully sinned since you got saved? All right. And obviously you have and I have and everybody else has. If a man tells you he doesn't sin, he's ready to be put in a straitjacket and locked away somewhere. He's dangerous. But he says plainly here that if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth. So what's that mean then, preacher? It means it has something to do with knowledge received and rejection that goes on inside the human heart. The book of Hebrews has to do with that in a very clear fashion. Look at verse number 29, Hebrews chapter 10. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Now watch this. And done despite unto the Spirit of grace. This is the willful sin. So what is the willful sin? The willful sin is that once you've received the knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord, you trod that under your feet and purposely reject it and say no to that, Amen. you are willfully Amen. rejecting light. Amen. Yes. And to trot it under your feet because you're counting it as a, as a, as a uh, contempt. You have contempt for it, for the sacrifice of Christ. And to turn from that means that you've blasphemed Christ, His blood, His sacrifice, His death for you and the work of the Holy Ghost. Because of the work of the Holy Ghost is to illuminate that in your heart, to bring you to conviction. And bringing a person to conviction is not necessarily a, a one event. In other words, it just it doesn't just all of a sudden happens and now here you are in full-blown conviction and you're ready to be born again. <laughs> Most of the time in bringing a person to conviction is a gradual thing. The light gets brighter and it gets brighter and it gets brighter and it gets brighter. You see yourself more and more and more as God sees you. 
And you're in the process of that. You're coming under deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper conviction until you're brought to the point of conversion and you're brought to the point of repentance. Because if there's no repentance involved in it, there's no conversion. I know some men in the past that have tried to, to pervert God's gospel and say that, uh, you know, they, they say, well, you know, repentance is part of belief and spin it like that there's no real repentance involved in salvation. And uh, I'd be awful careful to do that, folks. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you something. God Almighty can take us from the face of this earth anytime He pleases. Amen. We're nothing but a grasshopper here. That's right. And we get blown up with our own ego and our own feeling of self-importance when the truth of the matter is He got along for eternity before I ever showed up. Amen. And He'll get along for eternity after I'm long gone. Amen. I never added one thing to His stature. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need my eyes. He doesn't need my hands. He doesn't need me, but I need Him. Amen. So deflate yourself. <laughs> Come off your high horse. He doesn't need us. He uses us for the glory of God, and we become the recipients of His grace and are blessed greatly because God does use us, and He gives us meaning in life. And when God uses a, a dog or whatever, you know, you want to call yourself, the Apostle Paul said he was the chief of sinners. When God does use us, it ought to make us humble to think of where we came from and what He's willing to do with us now. Instead of pumping us up and blowing us up, it ought to do that. I've done a lot of reading the last few days as it, as it relates to the occult world. I haven't read much in the last two or three days. Holy Ghost said, take a break. I said, thank you. <laughs> That stuff, it gets old. I mean, that stuff gets into stuff that you just, you just, it's, it's another world, believe me. But I'll read a section, I'll read the comment section at the bottom, and you would be amazed at the people today who come out and say, and here, I'm going to paraphrase uh, some of their statements. I don't want anything to do with a God that would die on a cross like that and send his son to die for me, this bloody death. I don't want anything to do with it. What kind of God are you talking about? That kind of stuff is out there everywhere now. And it's in your face. These people are bold. And they're writing this stuff in the comments section. And it's over and over and over again. And I think to myself, my goodness, man. They don't have to know the Bible. They don't have to understand the Scripture. The Holy Spirit speaks to people. They're, they're angered. They're enraged. Because that we preach that Christ died for them. But listen. They're coming up to a point to where they can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Now here's the key. Look over here in 1 Timothy chapter number 1. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse number 13. 1 Timothy 1, 13. Paul said, who was before a blasphemer? See, he blasphemed, a persecutor, an injurious but I obtained mercy Thank you, Lord. because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, I quoted John Peter Lang to you before. I'm going to quote him to you again because he's good. John Peter Lang was a uh, German uh, theologian, lived in the 1800s. I don't agree with everything John Peter Lang says, but I respect him. Listen to what he says about Paul's testimony. But I obtained mercy. Lang quotes, not only because he obtained forgiveness of sins, but because also he was called to the apostolic office, established in it, and counted faithful. And why? He said, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. The apostle does not at all deny that his unbelief was sinful. It's a sin not to believe in Christ, and thus deserving of punishment. He here refers merely to the one fact which should mitigate this just sentence. <coughs> the agnoia, which is, it negates gnosis. It means agnoia means no knowledge. He was ignorant. The ignorance in which he had lived made forgiveness possible since he had not yet begun to sin against the Holy Ghost. His ignorance did not at all merit forgiveness but it left the possibility of it. Now that's good. That's very good. Because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. 
You see, he did not willfully sin after he had received the knowledge of the truth. Paul didn't. He was aware of Christianity, was called that way. He was conscious of people dying a martyr's death, as Stephen did right before him. He realized that these people were Jews. Most of them were Jews that had come straight out of the Jewish religion. He realized that what they were, that, uh, that what they were preaching was absolutely opposed to everything he believed. But that's as far as he got into it. Had he continued, though, on the path he was on, he would have come to a point when the Holy Ghost would have spoken to him and said, that's it for you. Because on the road to Damascus, the Lord said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? Saul said back to him. You remember that? It was at that moment the light started coming on in Saul's life. No human being has the ability to read the heart of another human being. I can't read your heart. I can't read it. I cannot tell what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. I cannot tell how much light you have. I cannot tell how far gone has, God has gone with you in the path leading you to salvation. I can't do that. I don't have that, and we shouldn't. Because that's, on, that's God's call, not man's. That's God. He's a sovereign God. Salvation is of the Lord, not man. I get the message out. He's the one that takes care of it when it's delivered. But the point is this. There is a place somewhere out there in the heart of a human being that when the light comes and the light comes and the light comes and the light comes, you'll say no to it for the last time. You may say no to it and not even realize you've said no to it because your heart has become hardened to the gospel and you're finished. You're done for. I'd like to think that we always have hope and I like to believe in deathbed confessions and I believe some of them are genuine. But if I were you tonight, I wouldn't put any stock in it. If the Holy Ghost has dealt with your soul about salvation and you know you're not born again, I wouldn't play with him and I wouldn't play with my soul. I wouldn't do it. To do that is more, is, is more danger than taking a revolver and putting one round in it and spinning the cylinder. That's Russian roulette. Spin the cylinder, cock the hammer, and pull the trigger. You got one chance out of six that you're going to blow your brains out. Russian roulette. That's what you're doing with your soul. You're playing with your eternity because you've heard it and you've heard it and you've heard it and you've heard it and you've heard it. So if you win, sin willfully after you've received the knowledge of the truth, that means if you've consciously said, no, I reject you, not now, maybe later. <coughs> to me, that is blaspheming Amen. the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. That's blaspheming. There is no sin that you can commit as an individual sin that will send you to hell except the one thing that will keep you out of hell. That's rejecting the Lord Jesus. But here's the key. Here's the, here's the kicker. You don't know when you've rejected him the last time. You don't know. You don't know. And that's so sad. That is so sad. So to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, who preached that? The Lord Jesus did. He said in uh, Luke chapter number 23, verse 34, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He preached about ignorance. Ignorance. Now is the world full of ignorance? Absolutely. John 9, 2, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Now, obviously, this is a lot of Jewish tradition. They won't find that in the Bible. <laughs> Uh, they thought, of course, that the man could be born blind because he sinned in his mother's womb. Notice the wording. Master, who did sin? This man <laughs> or his parents that he was born blind? That's bad shape. So what do you mean, preacher? Can a child sin before it's born? That's the implication here. I can understand the parents sinning, but what about the child? You see what kind, you see how people... Even these are, these are good men, these are disciples, yet they are so messed up in some of their theology. They get, people get messed up when they get out of the Bible. Where do they get that? They probably got it from Babylon. When they spent 70 years in Babylonian captivity, they picked up a bunch of junk. 
That's where the Pharisees were, were uh, created, where it came into existence in Babylon. And Babylon is, a, is the fountainhead of all idolatry, Babylon. Babylon, the Babylonian uh, uh, influence upon the faith of Christ, and upon, which is around today, by the way, or upon the Jewish religion was horrible, horrible, because uh, it is the seat of idolatry. If you'll get Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons, which is a classic, been around now for a couple of hundred years, uh, probably back in the 1800s, 1700s. I don't know exactly when it was printed, but it's, it's a classic. And Hislop does a lot of work in there. And the two Babylons, it'll spell it out for you. It'll show you the, the idolatry that's involved in the church today that came straight out of Babylon. All right? So here these people are saying, well, maybe the boy, maybe the child sinned in his mother's womb. Can a child be conscious of something in its mother's womb? That's a very leading question. <laughs> What about John the Baptist? He jumped up and down and shouted when, when uh, Mary announced he was in the womb of his mother Elizabeth. You see? Now whether God told him how it came about, I don't know, but I know he, 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 became, he became aware of the fact. Can, therefore, can you have divine intervention? Absolutely. But as far as children sinning in their mother's womb, <coughs> that's a hard one to accept, isn't it? Anyway, John 5, 9, 41, Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. The Lord said that. He's judging the motive of the heart. What does He say? What's He mean by this? He's talking to the man born blind and says, He's talking to the man born blind and to the people who are condemning Him in John 9, 41. He's talking to the Pharisees now who had excommunicated the blind man. And he's saying directly to them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. And they said they saw. And they said they saw, and by seeing, they rejected Christ. The Pharisees did, yet they say, We see. And the Lord said, You're blind. But the Lord said that if you never had seen or didn't profess to be able to see, He said, I'd give you light. But if you rejected me, the light, where are you going to get light? If you reject the light, folks, there is no other light. Once you've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, it's total darkness. Not partial darkness, total darkness. You either accept Him for who He is or don't accept Him at all. I am absolutely, completely, vehemently, adamantly opposed to any idea that there are lights out here in other religions that lead people to the truth and all of them eventually go to God. No, sir. Amen. No, sir. There's only one way to the Father. Amen. No man comes to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man. No man. No man. The Bible says in John chapter number 1 that he's the light yes. that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I can't explain that. And neither can 35 commentaries I've got. Here's the way most of them try to handle that scripture. Where it says, He's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John 1, along about verse 10, 12, somewhere in there. You can read it when you get home. Here's the way most of them handle it. They change the grammar. Coming into the world, He is the light that lighteth every man. Now, is there a difference in that statement and the statement by saying, He's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world? True. The true light, because of these faults. But here's the point. Here's the point. Coming into the world, He is the light that lighteth every man. That means that His coming into the world, He's the light. And so, if all men have to do is see that light, and they're going to see the light. That is a truth, but that's not the truth. That's not what John 1 is talking about. Read it, brother. Now, did you hear that? That is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What's that mean? That means that the Lord Jesus Christ is the true light. Amen that has been put into the soul of every human being ever born on this planet. Did I misinterpret that? No. 
That's what it says. Read it again. See that? Now, if I change the grammar, and I can, just like I did for you a moment ago, I can change the grammar and change the meaning completely. And that's the way most of them handle it. You know why they do that? They cannot conceive in their heart that the Lord Jesus Christ, light, can dwell in a human being that has never heard the gospel. Is that, that right there, is that the, uh, so a child cannot go to hell simply because the sin is not imputed into them, but at the same time, until that they can reject the Holy Ghost, they're not accountable. That's what we call the age of accountability. Okay. Whatever age it is. Whatever the age is. Okay, okay. You see how it goes? Oh, yes, yeah. You see how it goes? Mm -hmm. Until that child comes to the time, to the age, whatever that age is for that child, where it consciously rejects that gospel of the grace of God, what happens to that child? A two-year-old dies. It hasn't rejected Christ. Where does it go? All right. John, what's that reference in John 1? What verse is that? Verse 9. Just take John 1 9, go home and read it and pray over it, and you'll begin to understand what grace there is with the grace of God and what a gracious, merciful God He is. So, what happens then? What happens is very, very simple. I was alive without the law once, but the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. So, by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. When the law came, in plain words, when I was old enough to understand it, then what it did it do? It brought condemnation. So the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not coming into the world, He is the light that lighteth every man. That's a complete change of the grammar and the meaning of the sentence. So, what is it? It's ignorance. John 15, 22, He said, If I had not come spoken to them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. John 15, 24, If I had not done among them the works which none of the man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my Father. Some things God reserves to Himself. But here's the thing. Here you sit in this building tonight, and the Lord Jesus had come into the world 2,000 years ago. How many of you heard about it? You all did. How many of you have got a Bible? You all have. They're going down to Haiti. They're going to go down there and preach to people who have been, uh, who have been under the influence of voodoo. Is there any gospel of Christ in voodoo? Is there one word in voodoo about the shed blood? Salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, receive Him, accept Him, and be born again? Not a word in voodoo about that. Not a word. So what does the voodoo priest do? The voodoo priest fights them. Why does he fight them? Well, for one thing, he wants to maintain his power and his authority over the people. That's one of the reasons they do it. And they fight him. But here's a man down there preaching the gospel. He's down there carrying the light. So the voodoo priest has the light presented to him. It's there. It's available. Yet the voodoo priest says, I want no part of it. What happens to that voodoo priest? You see, he's turned away the gospel. He's turned away the light. He's had the opportunity. And he said no to it. And that's what happens to him. He goes off into judgment and damnation. That's what happens to him. So the Lord Jesus talks about ignorance. Then he talks about blaspheming the Holy Ghost, sin in the heart. Then he talks about willful rejection. In Luke chapter number 20, verse 13, Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I'll send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. Luke 20, verse 14, But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard, killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do to them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen, and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken, but whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. 
Now watch this. Verse, 20, verse 19, Luke 20. And the chief priest and the scribes the same hour sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. So what's that mean, preacher? It means that he read their motive and told them exactly why they rejected him. That's why. They rejected him. This is his son. They knew who he was. Go back and read it again. They said, verse 20, chapter 20, verse 14, when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. They weren't, they weren't near as ignorant as they pled to be, professed to be. <coughs> the people were ignorant <coughs> because the people have always had a horrible, horrible weakness of trusting their leaders. Same thing in America. <laughs> that's a very weak, <laughs> that's a fault. That's a fault to a fault. Because most of the leadership in this country is a bunch of liars, whether Republican or Democrat. <laughs> I tell my granddaughter when I leave the house, don't let any Republicans or Democrats in this house while I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does that mean then? That means that he knows the motive of the heart. What's that mean? That means he knows what you'd do if you had an opportunity to be saved and a light came to you and it flooded your soul and blew up in front of you like a sun. He knows whether you'd receive him or reject him. That's what he knows. That's what he knows. Just judgment and condemnation, folks, is just. God's just and the justifier of him that believeth on Jesus. The greater sin... The Lord Jesus talks about degrees of sin. John 19, 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Matthew 23, 14. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Think about that. I know a lot of preaching, is, a lot of good preaching is not necessarily good doctrine. Isn't that strange? Then mm -hmm. I'm a preacher telling you that. You preach, well, everybody goes off into judgment. They go to judgment, but it's not the same for all of them. According to what he just said right here, the damnation of one may be far greater than the damnation of another. It does make a difference. It makes a big difference. To these Pharisees who profess to be the teachers and the light and the, and the leaders of the blind, he said, you will go off into judgment and your damnation will be much greater than those that you led into ignorance. So the Lord gave you degrees of sin. He said in John 19 verse 11, they hath the greater sin. Then he brought in the parable as it relates to sin. In the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 12, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Parables. The Lord Jesus Christ instituted a parable. What was the point of the parable, preacher? To protect. That's what it was. To blind and protect. And then give out a meaning that related to those who wanted to know it. He said, Father, he said, it pleased you to hide these things from the wise and the prudent and to reveal them unto babes. To babes. So, Holy Father, God chose to do that. So, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the fact that during the ministry of the Lord Jesus and the kingdom ministry, when he was here preaching the gospel of the kingdom, when they rejected him, he began to preach parables to them. And it wasn't until they had rejected him till he preached the parables. That's very important. A parable was designed so that it had a message for those that God wanted to know it, but for the vast majority of the people, it just shut their eyes. They couldn't understand it. And you that are in my Sunday school class, we've been through that time and time and time again. And uh, talking about that in the last chapter of the book of Acts, we talked about how that the Lord, that uh, the Apostle Paul quoted the book of Isaiah chapter number 6. And in Isaiah chapter number 6, he said, Seeing they hear not, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not. The heart of these people is waxed gross. 
lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and be converted, and I should heal them. God shut them off and blinded them. And then in Romans chapter number 11, he says they're blinded. And they're blinded because of the, of the, uh, of the will of God. So a parable is one of those things of the grace and mercy and long-suffering of God that's given out to us so that God can speak to us. Uh, you know, God wants a relationship with us. He really does. But He won't play games with you. He won't play games. He won't play mind games. He won't play, he won't play sin games. He won't play it. You know, you can do penance and you can do this and all the rest of that stuff all you want to. But the truth of the matter is, you know when you've come to the point you're ready to get right with God and give it up. <coughs> the Apostle Paul says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what he said. And why does he say that? Because it works repentance. It works repentance not to be repented of. Not the repentance of the world, but the repentance of Christ. That's what men have to do. They've got to repent. They've got to come to the point in their life when they quit making excuses for their sin and just say, Lord God, I'm sick and tired of him hauling around with you. I'm tired of this. Forgive me for it. And I'm turning from it and give me the grace I need to get victory over it. That's repentance. You say, preacher, repentance is a change of mind. If it's, if, listen, if the changing of your mind doesn't change your life, it didn't change. <laughs> let me tell you why. Let me tell you the, let me give you the pitfall in that, okay? I uh, forget the word. I forget, uh, what is that Greek word? It didn't make any difference. Uh, here's the way they do it. They say, and they, everybody likes to be clean, uh, clinical, uh, everything's cut and dried, black and white, simple, simplified. And so when a preacher, repentance is simply a change of mind. Well, let me ask you a question. Which mind did you change? Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Have you got that mind? Have you got the mind of Christ or was it your, is it your fleshly mind? You see what I mean? Here's how you know you repented. Not by some mind games you're playing up here where you've changed your mind, blah, blah, blah. You know you repented when it affects your life. Amen. When you start consciously turning from something and turning to Him. When you turn away from a sin and turn to Him, then you're repenting. Amen. Repentance otherwise is just mind games. There's not a man on the face of this earth that could tell you every waking moment of their life, 24-7, if you went up to them, and you ask them this simple question, just ask them a simple question. Are you absolutely convinced in your heart right now that you've got the mind of Christ, or are you uncertain that you may simply be thinking with your fleshly mind? If somebody asked me that question, I'd say back to them, I think I've got the mind of Christ, but if you don't know the truth about it, I need to get on my knees in my hole and shut the door and shut the world out for a while and make sure I've got the mind of Christ. Because I've got another mind. And as I said to you before, I've got a mind that's got a mind of its own. <laughs> the one that's got a mind of its own is that unsaved mind. And if you've been saved, how many have been here been saved for 20 years? Raise your hand. You've been saved 30 years. I want to ask you a simple question. You've been saved 30 years. This is a simple question. Has anything about your old nature ever gotten any better? If anything, worse. Nothing. You know why? God did not save anything of your old nature. It's up to the new man to be put on it's up to the new man to bring into subjection. It's up to the new man to crucify. It's up to the new man to reckon. It's up to the new man to bring the old man into subjection. Because the old man never will on its own. 
oh, it can get subtle and deceptive and become religious and quote scripture and make you think it has reformed. And now you can live at peace with the old man. But that old man is laying a foundation where Satan can take a place in your life. Once he takes a place in your life, he'll build a stronghold in your life. And once he builds a stronghold in your life, he will begin to dominate you. And the only way you can ever get that stronghold back out of your life is to assault it. <laughs> once you've given place to the devil, you don't have to assault giving place to the devil. Satan takes that place. The way you handle him not getting place to the devil is by claiming the promises of God and walking in fellowship with the Lord. You do that. You walk in fellowship with God, claim the promise of God, walk in fellowship with the Lord, plead the blood of Christ, confess your sins, acknowledge when you've done something. But once Satan gains a place in your life and you see he's not ready to leave, he will immediately begin to build a stronghold in your life. In other words, a fort. And once he builds a fort in your life, he, he, he brings his forces together. And you now have something inside you that you're going to have to assault. You're going to have to bring some real weaponry against it to cast it out of your life. And that, you know, that happens. It happens. It's subtle when it does. But that's the only way that you'll ever have fellowship with the Lord. Our spiritual battle is not a simple thing. It's not an easy thing. All right, I'm going to close with this one. <coughs> In Luke chapter number 7, verse 47, Wherefore I have said it to thee, Her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. You see, the Lord Jesus has that ability to forgive. And the more he has forgiven you for, the more you love him. And the more thankful you are. You show me a man or a woman who's had a freight train load of sins forgiven and an unbelievable burden lifted from their soul and know it. And I'll show you somebody that is shouting and praising God and glorifying God and walking in victory and love the Lord. Because if you could, I won't post them. Some of these things that I get through that internet ministry. On the, on the line of Judah, I will not post for people to read because they are so, some of them are so, are so uh, drastic. Some of these people are on the verge of, of talking about suicide. And why they talk like that? Because their sins are coming down on them. It's unbelievable at the testimony you get from people today and how they talk about how they feel. And they're pleading, they're begging for somebody to help them get that burden off of them. And I say to you, and I say to them, and I say to anybody, there's one who can take that burden away. Just one. Satan will take, he may lift one, move it aside, and then bring another one right in its place. But there's one who will lift the burden and cleanse the soul. And it's not what you do, it's who he is. It's not up to you to be able to, uh, to, uh, to meet any requirements that God lays out. You can't. But it's who Christ is. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the answer for everything. Amen. And He's the answer for sin. Yes. Amen. He is. And so therefore, according to the New Testament, He was the Master when it came to acknowledging and making known all of the nuances <laughs> All of the subtleties of sin. You got it right there from the Lord Jesus Christ. You got it from Him. And sin and all of its subtleties, you get it from Him. He's the one who spelled it out, was the Lord Jesus. Father, in Thy name we pray. I ask You to bless what I've used tonight for the glory of God. I bless my brothers and sisters and those who hear this thing over the Internet, those who will watch it later. If they'll only understand that by coming simply by faith and by that faith receiving faith, faith believing you're going to give them faith, faith believing that you won't reject them, faith believing that you'll draw them closer, and by that faith receiving the strength and grace they need, then to repent and turn from it and then have the power through grace to get victory over it and put it behind them and draw nigh to Thee, and receive forgiveness, salvation, mercy, and cleansing. 
I pray for that tonight in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, I ask it. And amen. God bless you. I appreciate you listening to me.